that face that 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 one shot of yusaku is like that is character defining for me that is uh, oh my god i know that seems so weird that i'm currently praising one screenshot it it's not even animation he's just stand still like it's just a still image of his face but i fucking love it and it's a genius way to open the episode and bring us in to what's next y'all know the face i am talking about it is the shot when he get let, let's get into the setup first so it's been like what an hour after the events of the last episode uh, Yusaku and the gang go straight to the airplane and for some weird reason the airport let a hot dog truck into it and then they open the plane to two teenagers and a grown ass dude who runs a hot dog stand and then the assistant wasn't like who the fuck are these people none of that happened but I honestly don't care because just the whole thing is genius. First and foremost, the idea that there was an emotional reaction from the characters. That idea that the first thing they did, it wasn't let's have an exposition dump. It wasn't let's just go from plot point to plot point like we get a lot in this show. It was we need to check on them. We need to see what's happening. We need to see that they're all right. That feels very much like a conscious effort to bring emotion into it and to bring relationship into this because it's sort of like that idea from Yusaku's perspective. I've always been this fixed point of she's never bad and she tried to like reach out to him and then she tried to reach out to I and none of it worked and completely just blew up in her face and they lose Akira who also tried to be very nice so when Yusaku gets there the feeling of the scene is I gotta make sure they're all right and when it turns out Akira's gone and Aoi just looks lost we get a face we don't get out of Yusaku like we've seen him angry we see him angry a lot and we've seen him sad, like when Kusunagi lost their duel, and when Yusaku woke up from a nightmare in a flashback, but this is different. The look he has, the expression he has, it's vulnerability, it's sadness, it's sympathy, it's fear, it's just wanting to, being lost and not knowing what to do. All of that is conveyed in a single frame of animation. And like, yeah, obviously you had all the buildup, but it's a genius frame and it informs everything we get out of Yusaku for the rest of the episode and maybe even for the rest of the season. Like, you look, like, look at what happens next for Yusaku. Uh, we see that Link Vrains has reopened, which is whatever. Uh, I think we all knew we needed our setting back. Uh, but then just like when Revolver's like, what if it's a trap? And what if we do find I and all that? And Yusaku's like, we got to do what we got to do. It felt deliberately like his reaction was much quicker and had much more of a level of intensity to it than it would under a different circumstance. Cause this isn't the same circumstance, even though it's I, I has now in a lot of ways crossed a line Yusaku didn't want him to cross because he hurt someone Yusaku cares about. He hurt two people who haven't betrayed Yusaku. He hurt a girl Yusaku might care a little bit more about and all of that was very well conveyed and that's what happens when you have good build-up scenes like character interactions and having them have actual screen time and it's just a really clever shot and I really liked it a lot. I know we haven't even gone past like the first two minutes of the episode, but I think they wanted that shot to matter and I think it worked very good. So yeah, then moving on, uh, we have the next scene, uh, which is I doing Doctor Strange type stuff better than anything we saw in Doctor Strange. What I love about that scene is the background music. I love sort of this victorious sort of like happy song they're playing as i puts his plan into motion it feels more than just a generic villain doing generic villain stuff like there's more to this there's more going on here and we're gonna get to see it in all potential positive and negative side effects oh uh one last thing with the uh alloy stuff i really like yusaku's voice actor right before they leave alloy's house um, kind of the way he's talking to her, it felt to me like it had a le it 
carried on that form of like heavy hearted sadness to it. Like he still tried to be in charge and think of the right thing to do, but it felt different to me anyways. Uh, so yeah, then we get, uh, the scene with the assistant, uh, going into soul technologies. I like, we get a visual representation of that. They could have treated soul technologies being closed down as like just a thing in the background. Like someone just says it, but no, we get kind of a shot. I think a lot of people could relate to a very nice little side effect of everything that's going on. And that's that all these people lost their jobs and now the androids are in charge and like you see the assistant walking through the main office and it's kind of like soul technologies is always made out to seem like this very powerful vibrant organization that's always got like a million things going on and is always busy and to just sort of see them just like just empty like that you really get the impression of I's power and how he was able to bring them down and I think it's a nice just showing of what's going on and the effects it can have also that guy who she said bye to he got a nice severance package so I's a good company destroyer at least he got a severance package when I left my last job I wasn't even allowed to take a donut from the break room like good for I <laughs> Uh, so then we get on to what is the other half of this episode, which is bizarre <laughs> in maybe all the right ways. Well, first we get Robopi's dream. Uh, I think the dream has a bit more to play into things than we get, but just going off of what we got in this episode. So the dream was him killing Emma and Blood Shepherd. And what is sort of good about this is that it sets up what we are supposed to view Robopi as for the rest of the time he's here, which is probably like one or two more episodes. And that is that Robopni is scary. Not inherently scary, because let's be real here, Robopni looks like a fucking Shota. Uh, he's just this little cute kid with a funny voice and a goofy deck and all of that stuff, so it can be very hard to make that threatening. So what they did is we see what's going on in Robopni's head. We see his dream. And that is his dream is him being happy and glorifying that he killed two characters. And more importantly, when those two characters died, that scene was played as dramatic. When we get that contrast where we see how different Robopi thinks from everybody and how Robopi really doesn't care, it makes Robopi scary. Robopi isn't scary because he looks scary or because he talks scary or because he's really any more threatening than any other villain we've had in Yu-Gi-Oh. What makes Robopi scary is that he has has no conscience he has no sense of humanity everything to him is just about get powerful destroy build our own world Woo! we're gonna have fun and that makes him very scary especially when you see how powerful he can be too uh then we get the confucius scene which is so weird it is so fucking strange you just laugh from how weird it is that is my reaction. That is really all I have to say. It's so bizarre. You just give in and laugh. It's not that anything they do in this bit is that funny. And also with the how the rest of the episode was to get a bit this goofy is just so off-putting and bizarre. You kind of can't help but appreciate it. Um, and then I is like, here, Robopi, you have free will now. You can dream. You can do all this stuff. And here's your own country. It's yours. Go there, my friend. It's so fucked up in the long run because Robopi is like so worshipping of I and think I is like the greatest person ever and his best friend and will do anything to help him. And it's just so good and great and I love him. But then when like Robopi leaves, I just kind of goes back to looking normal and just goes, by Robopi. I think he's setting Robopi up as a sacrifice or Robopi is or something bad's gonna happen to Robopi. I think the part of the dream where Robopi's like, I melted into the universe. I think that is a uh, inclining as to what is happening next and where this is going. And uh, I don't think it's gonna be pretty for Robopi. Also, if you want to confirm my theory that Robopi looks like a freaking Shota, for crying out loud, he goes to I, you look like a creepy old man. Just saying. Anyways, so then our final bit of worth talking in the episode, which is Robopi's own country, which again is really weird. He turns back into a vacuum and then like they're singing and they're dancing and it looks like Disney World. And I'm just sitting there wondering what someone was smoking when they made this. 
it, it's actually kind of fantastic and I kind of just love it for how absolutely weird it is and then soul burner shows up and i think even he looks weirded out so yeah uh that was this episode it felt kind of just like two episodes but i think it works i want to see what happens with yusaku and aoi who have to deal with this sort of trauma i want to see what terrible sort of weirdly hilarious things Robopi will do and where all this is going with I. It's really interesting to me. Uh, but what do you think about all of it below? Tell me that well, below. And as for the TCG question of the week, Dragon Mates. <laughs> Turns out the Dragon Maid archetype is literally like Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid and is dragons that are also mates. <laughs> I know that sounds redundant, but, like, they're made forms, and then they have the dragon forms, but they're kind of, like, funny-ish-looking dragons, and... Ugh. So, my question to all of you is, because uh, I think it's a fun idea to do archetypes like this, um, would you like to see any other animes get turned into decks? And if so, what would you want? Because I have two. I want either a Full Metal Alchemist archetype, or I just want an Evangelion archetype, not for any real reason other than I want an equip spell that somehow references Shinji's hand covered in his own jizz. You know Yu-Gi-Oh would probably do it. Anyway, so give me your answer to that below. And as always, click to like, click to subscribe, and join me next week when Salaman greats go up against uh, giant fighting appliances.